So hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we're going to start our session, Applied Micro 3, with first a presentation by Matthias Meredgin, um, hiring mental health professionals evidence from a large scale primary care policy in Brazil. The floor is yours. Feel free to ask questions through the chat or to interrupt the speaker. So good morning, everyone. Are, are you listening to me okay? Does it sound okay? Okay, great. So good morning. My name is Matias Merechen. I'm a researcher at IEPS, that's the Instituto de Estudos para Políticas de Saúde. I will be presenting a paper entitled Hiring Mental Health Professionals, Evidence from Large Scale from a large-scale primary care policy in Brazil. It is joint work with Rudy Rocha. Rudy is head of research at the EPS, the Director de Pesquisa. And he's also a, pro a professor at the Escola de Administração de Empresas de Sao Paulo of the Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Our paper is an impact evaluation of NASFIS, the Nucleus de Apoio à Saúde da Família, a policy aimed at broadening the scope of services offered by a family health team uh, from the family health strategy in Brazil, that's Brazil's main primary health care policy. So while the policy included many areas, so NASCIS were not focused exclusively uh, on mental health, mental health was a priority, and that's the focus of our paper. It's still work in progress, so all comments and suggestions are more than welcome. Uh, so just to give a little bit of context. The global burden of disease attributable to mental disorder is large and has been on the rise in the last decades. According to the global burden of disease study from 2019, mental and some substance use disorders account for more than 17% of the years live with disability globally. However, the treatment gap in mental health remains very large. Uh, in low and middle income countries, over 80% of people with depression or anxiety do not receive any treatment. To face that problem, uh, the World Health Organization uh, has advocated for integrating mental health care within the basic primary health care packages in countries as a tool for bridging the treatment gap and improving mental health outcomes. According to the World Health Organization, primary health care can be the appropriate setting for identification of mental and behavioral disorders, referral to specialized care when needed, and it's a platform for collaborative work and care between uh, primary health care workers and uh, workers in other levels of the healthcare system. So, uh, as I have mentioned, the aim of our paper is to investigate the effects of the Family Health Support Nuclei, or Nucleus de Apoio a Saúde da Familia, or NASFIS. Uh, NASFIS were implemented in 2008 to expand the services provided by Brazil's biggest primary health care program, the Family Health Strategy, through incentives for the inclusion of different specialized health professionals in primary health care. Uh, mental health is a priority of the policy, and policy guidelines recommend the inclusion of at least one mental health professional in every NASFIS. And the, these guidelines define psychiatrists, psychologists, and occupational therapists as mental health professionals. So to assess the impact of NASFIS, we exploit the rollout of the policy over time across municipalities using a difference in different strategy. Uh, we use the estimator proposed by Ches Martin to fail to circumvent the problems associated with the use of two-way fixed effects estimators in different, in different settings when treatment effects are heterogeneous over time. Okay. So we focus our analysis of the impact of NASFIS on two different areas. First, we assess the impact of the policy on the supply of healthcare professionals at the local level, um, local being the municipality level. Uh, we found that the policy increased the, the supply of non-medical health professionals, both at the extensive, so the number of professionals uh, per 100,000 residents, and at the intensive margins, the mean number of our work per professional. Focusing on mental health professionals, we found large effects on the supply of psychologists and occupational therapists. Uh, for example, uh, we found uh, an increased supply of around 76% relative to the main mean at baseline 
for psychologists and an increased supply due to NAFTA adoption of around 87% relative to mean at baseline for occupational therapies. And those effects are persisting in time and robust to different model specification. For physicians, including psychiatrists, those, those results are either null or much smaller and imprecisely estimated. Uh, and second, we also assess the impact of NASFIS on population health outcomes, but we were unable to find any impact on the policy on mortality, hospitalizations, or days on sick leave, either for conditions related to mental health, condition amenable to primary health care, or other conditions. So a little bit of background about the policy. NAFTIs were created in January 2008, and as I've mentioned, it was a policy created to expand the scope of services provided by family health teams. Uh, NAFTIs are designed to complement ba basic health care provided by family health team with the specialized care provided by specialists. They are multidisciplinary teams composed of medical and non-medical professionals, and they provide what the policy calls matrix support. So specifically for mental health, matrix support means that NAF specialists, so psychiatrists, psychologists, occupational therapists, can provide care directly to patients in consultations, but they can also supervise and work together with other family health team members to plan the treatment of uh, patients with mental and behavioral conditions. Uh, so all municipalities in Brazil can opt in the NAF program as long as they have at least one family health team. Um, by 2005, 90% of municipalities in our sample had at least one family health team. Uh, and municipalities receive fixed monthly transfer from the federal government and are free to choose what professionals they hire within the parameters defined by the program guidelines. So they can hire non-medical health professionals included in the program, psychologists, occupational therapists, dietitians, physiotherapists, pharmacists, or uh, medical specialists included in the program, psychiatrists, pediatricians, gynecologists, acupuncturists, uh, those are the main categories. Uh, so this is just to show the rollout of the program. The left-hand panel shows the rollout between 2005 and 2018, beginning in 2008. And by 2018, the last year of our analysis, around 77, 76% of municipalities uh, had received at least one NASFI. The right-hand panel just shows the number of NASFIs by type of NASFI. So there are three types of NASFIs. Um, what changes is mainly the number of family health teams they are linked to. So family NASFI 1 are for municipalities that have at least five family health teams. NASFI 2 for municipalities that uh, have between three and four. And NASFI 3 that began, were created in 2012, uh, began being implemented in 2013 are linked to just one or two family health teams. So what, what we did, we created a panel at the municipality level over the period from 2005 to 2018. And our final sample is composed of 500, uh, sorry, 5,564 municipalities observed throughout 14 years. Uh, and we have data from federal funding for NAS program, that's what we use to identify uh, treatment, number of professionals working uh, per municipality each year by profession and mean hours work per, per week, publicly funded healthcare services utilization, mortality, uh, publicly funded hospitalizations, and days on sick leave uh, financed by the National Institute of Social Security. And we have a wide array of controls also, uh, GDP per capita, age and uh, gender structure of the municipality, and data on concurrent policies like uh, per capita expenditure with Bolsa Familia, uh, number of doctors that are uh, inclu included in the More Physicians program, that's also uh, a policy that was implemented to expand 
general physician supply in primary healthcare in Brazil and has been, uh, its impact has been analyzed by Carrillo and Ferres in the paper in AHA and by Fontes and co-authors in the paper in health economics. So, uh, and we exploit, as I already mentioned, sorry, the staggered introduction of NAS across municipalities since 2008 and adopt the difference in difference strategy. We use the dynamic estimator proposed by the Chef Martin and Dolsfield, which allows us to retrieve ambiguous estimates if treatment effects are heterogeneous. So our estimator is based on the difference in the evolution of outcomes between municipalities that receive and ask at any point in time and municipalities that never receive or have not yet received and ask at, at that point in time. And under the parallel trends assumption, our estimator retrieved the causal effect of NASFIS uh, on our outcomes of interest. And we, we also estimate placebo effects to check for the credibility of the underlying parallel trends assumption. So we estimate dynamic and placebo effects for a time span of four years around uh, the year of treatment. And uh, we present event study plots for uh, each point estimate and table showing average placebo and average treatment effects and all standard errors were clustered at the municipality level. So uh, we start by showing the effect of the adoption of uh, NASFIS on the supply of mental health professionals uniquely identified at the municipality level. Uh, we see large um, persistent in time effects for psychologists and occupational therapists. So for psychologists, the effect is, uh, the average treatment effect is an increase of 5.4 professional per 100 residents. That's around 76% of the mean at baseline. For occupational therapists, we see an effect of 0.6 professionals per 100,000 residents, that's around 87% of the mean at baseline. And for psychiatrists, we see a smaller effect of 0.3 professionals per 100,000 residents, that's 33% of the mean at baseline, but it's more imprecisely estimated. It's only the average treatment effect is only significant at the 10% level. And in our preferred model, so here, for each plot, each plot has three models, a base model without covariates, a model with state-specific year fixed effects, and a model with state-specific fixed effect, year fixed effect, sorry, um, uh, or uh, time-varying covariates I mentioned previously. So none of the point estimates here is significant, uh, so it's much uh, more imprecise the estimates. Um, Oh, sorry. And for all outcomes, we see an absence of pretreatment trends. So we then look at other professionals, so professionals not related to mental health, and the pattern is more or less similar. We see large, um, persistent, in-time effects for most non-medical health professionals or for physiotherapists, dieticians, uh, phonobiologists, that's... Uh, some sort of speech therapist and social assistants. Uh, we see no effect for pharmacists, no, not for the specialist physicians included in the program. So gynecologists, obstetricians, pediatricians, and homeopathic physicians and acupuncture physicians were also included in the program, but uh, they are almost non-existent. So. So we would expect that the increasing health prof of health professionals comes from primary health care facilities where enough professionals should be registered. Uh, so we check if that was the case. Uh, there is a caveat here, as health professionals can work in more than one facility, we are not able to uniquely identify them here as we did in the previous results I showed. But uh, we see that uh, the increase in the supply of mental health uh, care professionals comes from uh, primary health care. We see large and significant increases in the number of professionals working in primary health care and much smaller and not, not significant effect of the adoption of the policy on the supply of mental health professionals outside of primary health care. 
uh, we see the same pattern for health professionals not related for with mental health. So the increase in the supply uh, comes from professionals working in primary health care facilities, as would be expected. So overall, we see a pattern of large impact of the policy in the supply of non-medical health professional and a much smaller or null effect on the supply of medical professional. So two relevant questions arise here. Where do the first one is where do those professionals come from? So using we we cannot really uh, show uh, where are they coming from, but we have some descriptive evidence that is suggestive of what is happening here. So where are those professionals coming from? Using data from the 2010 census, we compare the number of professionals uh, in the census. Those are the blue bars here in the left-hand panel with the number of professionals occupied in the healthcare sector. So professionals registered in the National Registry of Healthcare Facilities, that's the yellow bar here. And we see that the gap is much larger for healthcare professionals that are not, no physicians. So here, this is for doctors, there is a gap, but it's proportionally much smaller than for dietitians, pharmacists, physiotherapists, psychologists of, and social assistants. So there, there is a large availability of those professionals working outside of the healthcare sector in Brazil. And the second related question is, why did municipalities choose to hire non-medical health professionals with the funds they receive for adopting NASPES. So uh, the amount transferred by the federal government was independent of the type of professional hire, but physicians earn around three times more than all other health professionals. So this is mean income uh, for mean personal income for uh, generalist physicians, uh, specialist physicians. These are the, the biggest parts here. Um, they are two or three, around three times higher than for all other healthcare professions. So uh, those are uh, our main results on the supply, uh, effect of the policy adoption on the supply of healthcare professionals. We then look at, at the intensive margin and we found a positive effect on mean hours work per professional for some professionals. So for psychologists, there was an increase that amounted to about 6% of mean at baseline. So 2.1 hours per week uh, more work uh, per psychologist. We found no effect for occupational therapists or psychiatrists, uh, but we did find an effect for some other non-physicians, uh, like dietitians, phonodiologists, and social assistants. Uh, and those changes are again driven by increases in mean hours work in primary health care. Uh, we also looked at service utilization and we found positive effects on individual consultations with most non-medical professional categories. Uh, for mental health, we found an effect on consultations with psychologists, but not with the occupational therapists. But again, here it's important to remember that NAS professionals don't necessarily act through individual consultations. For example, they can coordinate the activities of family, family health teams. So. And then we look at the impact of the policy adoption on population health outcomes. Uh, the, the plots here are for our, our main results. So we see no impact on number of days on sick leave for mental and behavioral conditions, so for conditions including chapter five of ICD-10, neither for publicly funded hospitalizations for the same conditions, uh, also no impact for mortality for conditions related with mental health, and here we use DITUN and case classification of deaths of despair, so deaths related with substance use, suicide, and alcoholic liver disease. Um, we also found no impact uh, looking at non-mental health related outcomes, so conditions amenable to primary, primary health care or other conditions. Uh, looking, also no impact looking at more detailed uh, mental health conditions, so uh, 
looking separately to substance use, schizophrenia, mood disorders, uh, overdose, suicide, and, uh, we, we failed to find any significant effects. No impact on violence-related outcomes, mortality from assault, from transport accidents, or report of uh, violent episodes. Uh, and the absence of impact does not vary with availability of local mental health care services outside primary health care. So uh, in Brazil, there are the centers that are some psychosocial. The, those are the main specialized uh, mental health treatment center for more serious cases. Uh, there is a recent working paper by Luis Felipe, by Luis Felipe Cruz Fonches and Mateus Diaz that shows some impact of that policy on reduction of hospitalizations and increased homicides. So we look separately at municipalities that had one of those centers and municipalities that did not have one of those centers, but we also failed to find any, uh, any impact on population health outcome. So just to wrap, uh, beginning to wrap up here, uh, we did some robustness checks. Um, as I've said, all of our results were robust to different model specifications, models without covariates, but models with the inclusion of state-specific year fixed effects, and models with the inclusion of those non-parametric time trends and also time varying, time, sorry, time varying covariates. So both a family expenditure per capita, Asian gender structure, share of the population covered by family health team and by private health insurance, number of uh, centers that in some psychosocial per 100,000 residents, number of physicians higher under the more physicians or my medical program per 100 residents uh, and some other uh, covariate. Uh, the, the impacts of, uh, of the policy on the supply of health professionals are detectable independently of the type of NAS, NAS fee adopted. So I mentioned before, there are, are three types of NAS fees linked to the number of family health teams in each municipality. Uh, effects are somewhat higher for municipalities that had NAS fee two, that adopted NAS fee two or NAS fee three. And that is somewhat, is somewhat expected as those municipalities had proportionally less healthcare professionals at baseline. But the, the pattern is overall the same. And the absence of impact on outcomes is independent also on the type of NASF adopted and also looking, looking separately before and after the 2012 reform when NASF were made universal. Uh, and as a robustness check, we try to see if the policy adoption impacted the supply of some other health professionals, like nurses or community health worker uh, that are part of family health teams, but we, we find no, no impact. Uh, that is reassuring of our results being driven by NAS adoptions, uh, not some other non-observable local health points. So I think uh, I'm entering the final five minutes. So just two takeaways that we think are important from our results. First, we think that they suggest that incentives embedded in policies need to be designed according to the type of professional whose supplies they try to increase. And that is especially relevant for professionals that are more scarce, scarce and have higher outside options, like special doctors in Brazil. Uh, for mental health policy that is important because psychiatrists are very scarce in Brazil and they can count on higher outside options. And second, we think uh, our results suggest that increasing healthcare professional supply and service utilization might not be enough to improve health outcomes. Uh, that is, uh, there are some papers, like I've already said, there is a nice paper uh, assessing the impact of the more physicians, the uh, mice medicals policies by Cajillo and Ferris. Uh, they also found uh, no impact on health outcomes in their paper. So uh, there is some connection there with the literature. Um, but also for common mental health disorders like anxiety and depressions that have a high incidence and are highly disabled, but are frequently 
do not frequent, frequently result in deaths or hospital, hospitalizations, we think our results highlight the necessity of more detailed data at the local level. So these conditions are highly prevalent in Brazil, but um, we do not have detailed data at the local level. So thank you. I'm sorry about my uh, English. It's a bit enferruchado. <laughs> Don't know how to say that in English. Uh, so this is my email and any comments and suggestions are welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Does anyone have questions? May I ask a question? Sure. Hi, Matthias. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's quite, uh, it's very interesting work. Um, and I have a, a small question regarding, uh, you have like many, many outcomes, well, like the main specialities of uh, non-medical health professions. And did you correct your hypothesis tests for multiple hypothesis testing or are just like standard p-values? So standard p-values, we didn't work, like Bonferroni or... Uh, yeah, like Bonferroni some of those or like different. the more recent methods by a Zin Shake. Uh, uh, no, we, we didn't do that. Uh, but I would very much like uh, to have the reference about the more recent method you, you mentioned. Sure, uh, I will send you through the chat, no worries. Thank you. Great, thank you. We have a question here on the chat by Paulo Arbati. Uh, he's asking whether you tested against suicides and you didn't catch anything. Could you repeat the question? I'm not finding the chat here. So, oh, okay. Here. Yes. yes, we we didn't find any impact on suicide. So we look, it's one of the, 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 the causes of mortality we look at separately. So we look suicide, overdose, uh, alcoholic liver disease. Those are the three components of the deaths of despair. Um, we couldn't find any impact for any of them. So. Okay, then. So that's all. Thank you very much, Matthias, for the presentation. For now, Thank you very much. Can you uh, stop sharing your screen for Danielle? Great. So now we're going to have Daniel Araujo, who is going to present his work titled The Roots of Supernatural Belief. So, Danielle. A second. Your... Um. Are you seeing my, my slide? Okay, so this is a paper that I'm developing together with, with Professor Vlad Mikahilo from, from UFPE and Brendan Sampaio from UFPE. And I'm Daniel, I'm at the University of British Columbia. And this paper is entitled Social Organization and the Roots of Supernatural Beliefs. So, so just, um, okay. The main question in this paper is what are the long run determinants of contemporary variation in supernatural beliefs? In particular, we look to the persistence of witchcraft beliefs in, in Africa. And this can be defined as the superstition that certain people may have the ability to use supernatural techniques to cause harm or acquire wealth from others. This possibly see, seems a bit strange for, for us that are from economy, but there are a lot of evidence about how major religious, religion systems like Islam and Christianity affect decisions of peoples and, and have effects on, on health outcomes, labor outcomes, 
And, but there are a lot of mesh scale belief systems like witchcraft or like belief in spirits or other things like that, that also have effects on, on economic outcomes, but there are not much evidence on, on the economic literature. So specifically in this paper, we are looking to the persistence of witchcraft beliefs. This is really similar and occupying a space that is really similar to the space occupied by religion in, in those societies. For example, if in our society, if someone died, uh, a shield die of cancer, we say, oh, why, why did she die? So we say, oh, the shield died because God wanted or something like that. So in their societies, they say, oh, because someone put a spell, a spell on her or something like that. So when we think about witchcraft, the first thing that comes to mind is the European witch trials, where about 43,000 people were tried, and of those, around 16,000 people were murdered. But in, even in recent decades, thousands of people die in Africa due to, to witchcraft accusations. There is also a paper of, of Edward Miguel about rainfall and the number of murders of witchcraft in Africa today. And these, these type of beliefs are also linked to a lot of, of perverse outcomes like depletion of social capital, restriction to economic mobility, and estimations says that around million, million of people around the, all the continents have those types of beliefs today. So in particular, in this paper, we test the hypothesis proposed by an anthropologist, Paul Baxter, that says that the persistence of pastoralism is related to the adherence of witchcraft beliefs. And he says that because of two ma main mechanisms, the, the, main, the main point is that witchcraft is something really serious, accusing someone of witchcraft is something really serious. And you only do that when your relationship with this person is totally deteriorated. So in this, in this, in this environment, Becker say that there is two main mechanisms that, that for the pastoralist societies to have lower levels of, of witchcraft accusations. The first one is that they have freedom of movement because pastoralists have to take the cattle and go to, to, to long distance to, to, to get this cattle to, to different types of grass. So when they do that, even if it, they like their neighbor, they, like to, they have to move. So if they don't like, they have a huge incentive to, to not stay close to this person and the relationship does not deteriorate to this point. And the second main mechanism that he said that is important is the cooperation. He said that pastoral society is high cooperative. So for example, I have two types of animals. I have camels and I have cows. And, and my neighbor also has two types of, of animals and those, those, those two animals eat different types of, of, of grass. So I can take all the, all the, the camels and my neighbor can take all the, 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 the other animal to, to, to a different place. So in this environment, if someone accused me of using witchcraft to, to grow my herd, it, the person is not accusing just me, it's accusing all my network. So this is the, a second mechanism that he says that it's important to, to explain this, this pattern of lower level of witchcraft beliefs and witchcraft accusations in these societies. So even in, in, in anthropological, anthropological literature, there is, there is an, an, an quote that is interesting that Rigby, that is another anthropologist in 1981, said that that was a really interesting hypothesis, but the causal connection was still unexplored. So this is the point that we are trying to do in this paper is see if there is really a, a connection between those two variables. In the literature, in the economic literature, 
the paper relates to 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 a lot of papers, but these three are the 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 are uh, the ones that are more more close. The first one is the paper of Alexin et al. with about the 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 effects of plow, historical use of plow by the ethnicities and today's levels of gender norms. But more close, our paper is, is close to the paper of Boris Jeshman about the effects of Atlantic slave trade in Africa and the persistence of witchcraft beliefs on the European Economic Review. And also the paper of Enki Becker about how pastoral societies of the, the, historical, the historical presence of pastoral societies affect the presence of, of female genital cutting today. So, and she uses in this paper in Ristad, she uses the same identification that, that we use. And for our, our measure of pastoralism, we use a database built by, by Murdoch, that is an atlas, an et ethnographic atlas, that say for each ethnic group in Africa, how, how big is the dependence on animal husbandry in this society? And, in, and we interact that, that variable with a measure of an indicator of what's the type of animal that this society uses. Because there are some type of animals that are sheep, horses, and camels that are, that are animals that are pastoralistic animals. And there are other animals like uh, pigs and dogs that are not the right type of animals. So we built this measure of, of pastoralism. And after that, we do an IV with the suitability for pastoralism in, in the continent. So, and our measure on witchcraft beliefs came from, from a survey from 2009 in several countries and ba is based on two questions. The first one is, do you believe in witchcraft? And the second one is, if you believe in the AVI or that certain people can cast spells or course to, to make bad things happen to someone. So this is our main regression. We regress the witchcraft belief, if the question about the belief in witchcraft in the presence of pastoralism. And we introduce several variables in the individual level, ethnic group level, and, and region level of controls. And we also introduce later country fixed effects, region fixed effects, and the effects seems really, really and, and consistent. Even when we introduce the region fixed effects that most part of the literature don't introduce. After that, we do an IV where we, because could be that pastoralism is some, some way and, and caused by, by witchcraft beliefs. So to deal with that, we use a database on the suitability for pastoralists, for pastoralism for all the continents and built for a five by five kilometers grid. And because pastoralism is, is, if a place is suitable for pastoralism is related to the type of soil. There are some type of soil, some, some, some level of temperature. And we use that as an IV in our, in our ethnic measure of, of pastoralism. This is quite similar to the paper of Marcelo Alson in American Economic Review, where she built an, an suitability for the set set fly and relate that with the economic development. So in, this, in these two figures, we have the raw data. In the figure in the left, and these, these areas are the ethnographic areas. It's the areas that were habited by each ethnic group in Africa. So in the left, we have the presence of suitability of, for pastoralism. And on the right, we have the, the, the presence of witchcraft beliefs in this ethnic group today. And even in this, in this raw data, we can already see some some type of pattern these areas that have lower levels of of witchcraft beliefs seems to match with the areas that that have higher suitability for pastoralism so 
but but this is is only the, the raw data. This is our first st first stage of, of the of the the IV. We have the length suite ability for pastoralism and the relationship with the historical dependence on pastoralism. This is the bean scatter plot and seems to be a strong first stage. And this is our, our reduced form, the relation between length suite ability for pastoralism and witchcraft beliefs and seems to have a negative correlation. So this is our main table. In the first column, we have the effect of the historical dependence of pastoralism on, on contemporary witch beliefs. On the first column, it, we don't even include the country fixed effects, and we can already see an, an, an positive effect. And even in, in the column six, where we, int we introduce region fixed effects, the effect seems to be pretty consistent with the introduction of, of controls, the region controls, the historical, the individual controls, and the regional controls. So it seems that the effect is, is pretty, pretty resistant. And we find that one standard deviation increase in pastoralism have an effect of 5% in the, 5% decrease in the witchcraft beliefs. And this is around 10% of the sample mean. So after that, we go to the IV and we have a strong first stage and, and we find that the effect even, even increase a bit when we, when we use the, the instrument, instrument of variable. After this, we are gonna try to look to the main mechanism that, that Baxter said in his, in his paper in 1972. So the first one is that there is an, an, an effect due to the freedom of movement of these societies. So if I, instead of create my measure of pastoralism using the right type of animals, if I create a measure, use the wrong type of animals, like the interaction between the dependence of this society to the animal husbandry. And if the animal is pigs, dogs, foals, bees and this is our, the, our first test and the second one is that Baxter says that even inside the and pastoralist societies there are there are an intensity if this society is fully nomadic he says that the effect is even stronger because the effect is coming from from this freedom of movement you can go away and 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 from your neighbor so we use a data at, uh, and and a variable from, from the Murdoch Atlas about this type of settlement. So we can construct a measure of fully nomadic pastoralists and non-fully nomadic pastoralists. So when we look to these variables, in this first column, we have our main, our main estimate. In the second column, we introduce the, 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 wrong, the wrong variable for pastoralism, the the dependence on animal husbandry, if this animal is not a herding animal. So if this variable, we don't find any effect and seems that our effect is coming only from the historical dependence on pastoralism. And if we, if we decompose our main measure in the nomadic pastoralism and the non-nomadic pastoralism, seems that our effect is even stronger when the society is fully nomadic without any type of agriculture or or things that make the society more settled. And the second mechanism is about cooperation. He says that these societies are more cooperative. So we look to the, to the levels of trust in this society. So we take, we take the Afrobarometer for Africa and for each society we have how much you, tr you trust in relatives, neighbors, courts, local council. And we found a positive effect on these variables. And in the economic literature, the levels of trust is, is used as a proxy for, for cooperation. So this seems to be a, an, an, an plausible hypothesis. So a next point is that it could be the case that pastoralistic groups today live in areas that are more developed 
and 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 our our effect is coming because of that. So to see if that's the case, we conduce some some tests. The first one is we look the suitability of the place that the people live today, and we drop off the sample people that live in areas that have high suitability for pastoralists. And even among the people that live today in areas that have lower levels of, of suitability for pastoralism, you be from an ethnicity that have a huge historical dependence on pastoralism has an effect on, on a negative effect on the persistence of these beliefs. And we also interact this like, like Nathan and Dizzy doing his paper about, about slave trade and, and, and trust. Even if we, if we interact the variables of, of location-based and ethnicity-based suitability for pastoralism, we found the strong effects and, and our effects persist even with that. This graph is the, is the estimates when we drop from the sample people that live in areas that, are, that have a high level of suitability for pastoralism. And even if we drop half of the sample, don't change most, most, much our, our estimates. So after that, we conduct, conduct uh, several, several robustness checks. We also go to, to world databases because our main database is only on Africa. So we go to the cross-cultural sample, standard cross-cultural sample that have only few societies but they have information about only for, for, for six or sites. So this is only suggested, but we found the, the negative correlation between the historical dependence of pastoralism and the presence of witchcraft beliefs. And they also have another proxy for cooperation, like loyalty to the ethnic group. And we found a positive effect on this loyalty. There is information of witchcraft beliefs for Asia and in the north of Africa too. So if we, but they don't have any information about the ethnicity. So we construct a measure of land suitability for pastoralism of the region that the people live. And we found a negative association even outside Africa. And we also get data from the World Value Survey about trust. They, they have 20, 21,000 people from, several countries on, in the world. And we find that there is an, an association between the dependence of pastoralism and the levels of trust. And, and we do also, we drop from the sample each country of our sample, we drop each ethnicity, we conduct permutation tests, randomizing inside the sample our, our treatment to see how easy it is to, to our results. Be, it came, came from, from the randomness of the data and seems to be really hard. And, and different clustering strategies and tests on, on unobservable selection and, and, and those things. And even doing all this robustness seems that our results are are pretty, pretty consistent and, and, and that the hypothesis is, is strong. So concluding, we are providing evidence that social organization of the society could have an effect on the emergency of, of, of these small scale belief systems. And this is consistent with, with the anthropological hypothesis. So that's it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, do we have any questions? You can also go through the chat if you prefer. Okay. 
Um, you guys can see my screen. Can you see the lights? Yes. Okay. Okay, so, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Ricardo, I'm a PhD student at Brown University. I'm going to present today this joint work with uh, Axel Herson, who's here at Brown, and Natalie Cox, who's teaching at Princeton. Yeah. Um, feel free to interrupt with questions, either uh, speak out or just send a message to the chat. If I see it, I will reply. Okay, so today we're going to present this project, Do Peer Preferences Matter in School Choice Market Design, Theory and Evidence. Centralized university admission systems have been adopted by countries more and more. So from almost no country in the 50s to now more than 45 countries adopting some form of centralized university admissions. And one of the most important concepts that we have in market design literature is whether the allocations that the systems provide are stable, which means that there is no pair of university and students who would prefer to outside of the, the mechanism to, uh, to reach a deal that's preferable to both. So we know from Roth and the big literature that stable, uh, stable mechanisms tend to, um, tend to last much longer and adoption increases fast, etc. So generally, to find a stable matching, we have some assumption on how preferences are, and we use a mechanism, generally some variation of the famous deferred acceptance mechanism in the mechanism design in the market design literature, that ensures that we're gonna get a stable matching as long as the assumption on preferences are holding. But the question that we have here in this paper is, what if the school choice mechanisms that we have are actually misspecified? So students might have preferences over both program, programs and the distribution of their peers, the ability of their peers, but the, mechan the mechanism don't ask uh, each student to report on how the ability of their peers would matter for their preferences. They only ask about their programs, about which program they prefer. So here are the punchlines, which are these four. First, we're going to ask, do students have peer preferences in university uh, admissions? And we're going to use data on Australia's college admission system and argue that yes, they do. Does a stable matching exist in this setting where individuals have peer preferences? And we're going to ask, uh, answer again that yes, they do under a mild continuity condition, but this is hard to find using the regular mechanism that you use, like some variation of deferred acceptance or others from the literature. We're going to ask what happens if we try to find a stable matching using a regular canonical mechanism that is misspecified, only asking about program preferences, where people, where students have preferences for both peers and and and, uh, and schools. And we're going to say that over time, if you try to do that, a pseudo tautonomous project uh, process is going to emerge, where students' beliefs about their peers change over time depending on what happened in a previous period. This process dynamically might lead or might not to a stable matching over time. And we're going to provide a test for convergence to stability. If you see scores of each individual at each school, how do I know if I'm reaching a stable matching or not? And we're going to test it with the Australian data. And finally, we're going to see that in general, this pseudo autonomous process may not lead to convergence to a stable matching. We're going to propose an alternative, a centralized autonomous process that has better performance. Uh, it's an iterative mechanism where in each period, where in each period I ask students for their uh, for their preferences, but give also their, uh, some information on what's the preferences of others. So like CISU in Brazil and other systems in, Ch in China, Germany, and Tunisia. Okay. So just to know about some types of peer preferences that you observe in the school choice and college admissions literature. So a strand of the literature has argued that students have these preferences for being in a big pond. Parents in primary and secondary school like to send their children to programs with higher peer quality in some way. 
students who have better scores. Even this Abdul Kabir Oglu paper from 2020 actually argues that when you control for your quality, they don't seem to have preferences for other school aspects in the New York system. Another trend of the literature has seen that uh, students, not their parents so much this time, have some preference for uh, not being in the lowest uh, achievement of the distribution, in the bottom of the distribution. They have a negative, they, they get a negative self-concept and they perform worse in many settings. So they so they like to be with good students, but not to be below, much below in the distribution. In this paper, we're gonna find that students do suffer some kind of utility loss from being below something that's like the median score, but they don't care much about being above it. Okay, we're gonna have a model that's general for both. both. They both want to be in a big pond, but they don't want to be a big, uh, a small fish. In. They have this big fish preferences. Okay. So I'm gonna go a little bit through the model. Um, I know this is an applied micro presentation, but uh, I'm gonna go through the model a little bit because this is an important part of the paper overall. And then uh, I'm gonna go through how do we identify the peer preferences, both their functional form and their existence in this setting of the Australian college admissions market? So, our players here are going to be a continuum of students with this type space theta. And we're going to have this eta non atomic measure over the type space, normalized so that the measure of the entire space is one, just like a probability measure. And we're going to have a continuum of students, but a finite set of schools goes from C1 to Cn plus C0, which is going to be an outside option. Like I'm not going to go into any school or any program. Each with a positive capacity and the outside option is unlimited. Everybody who wants can go to the outside option. So this QC0 is equal to infinity. Okay. Um, so student preferences are going to depend on their peers. Matching mu, as we have here, is going to be a measurable function that for each, uh, is going to assign to each student a program and to each program a subset of students, not violating its capacity constraints, the, 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 that key Q that I mentioned. And assignments are two ways. So this is the uh, informal way of saying it, and this is the formal one. So mu of theta, theta each type of student, um, is going to be some school in the set of finite schools plus the outside option. And for any schools, the set mu c is some measurable function that satisfies the capacity constraints. So the size of the, the students, the, the eta of the set is going to be lower or equal than the constraint qc, the capacity constraint. And these things must be consistent. If theta is in mu c, if theta is the type of student that was assigned to uh, school c, then school c must be the school that uh, it was assigned to. Okay, so we're going to be dealing with students. Each of them having a specific time type that is uh, summarized by two things: their ability, which is supposed to uh, their score, and it's supposed to be type specific or program uh, uh, school specific or program specific. So therefore, I have this R score that has the superscript theta for the type and C for the program. So this is supposed to represent the preferences of uh, programs over students. They might have different preferences. Programs here might be understood as being particular major programs. They don't need to be entire universities, for example. Uh, in the Australia system, as we're going to see, people don't apply just for a university like they do here in the US. They apply for particular majors. I want to do um, uh, I don't know, economics at University of Melbourne. I don't just apply to University of Melbourne. So therefore, programs might have different preferences over students in principle. And we're going to have this utility u theta c given mu. So we have a utility for the type theta attains from attending program c, given that the entire matching of the economy is this matching mu. Okay. Now, of course, if I am assigning a utility for 
each individual and being, ass being assigned to each program, this induces uh, a preference relation okay, that we're going to represent like this, the, the preference of theta given a matching. Remember, everything is given a matching mu because we're thinking that individuals might have a preference over who their peers are. Okay. Now, we're going to be a little more restrictive on how we think of these peer, this peer preferences can be. So these are not going to be identity specific peer preferences as in the literature for matching with uh, couples where I care about where my, uh, my wife or my husband is going. But here I only care about the ability of my peers. So given a distribution of ability, let's say this lambda C mu, which would be the distribution of ability for a specific uh, program C in a matching mu, uh, individuals have a preference only over that. Okay. So this is just a CDF, a uh, cumulative distribution function, of how many individuals have a score R theta C lower or equal than this X. Now, uh, as I said, stability is a very important notion in market design, but in particular for this type of model here uh, that follows a literature in, in market design, a fairly recent one that has a continuum of individuals. One side is a continuum, which is the students, and another side is a finite set of programs. We need to have a notion of stability here, which might be a little bit different because we have a whole continuum of individuals. So a student program pair, a type theta of student and a program C are going to be blocking a matching, a matching mu, for example, if there is a uh, program C is preferred by college uh, theta under, again, the, the matching mu to whatever type theta got in this matching, which is mu theta, and either the school did not have uh, reached school capacity, there were some seats left, so the measure of students who are attached to the school is strictly lower than the capacity constraint. Or if there is um, another student that was assigned to the school but has a lower score. So either there were seats left, but I was not allowed to get in there, even though I prefer it to what was given to me by mu. Or some other school was able to, some other student was able to get in with a lower score at that program instead of me. Okay. So I have this kind of justified end in a sense. I would like to be in the position of student theta prime, but, uh, and, and I had all the right because the school also prefers me to that, to that student because my score is higher than his. But um, even, though, even though that's true, I still didn't get in. And a patch, a matching, as usual, is going to be pairwise stable if there does not exist any student program blocking pairs like this. Okay. So the first type of theorem that we have is that if peer preferences are continuous in a particular sense, they don't change much when the, uh, the entire distribution changes by very little, entire matching, then there's going to exist a stable matching. So in this setting, if we ask Peer preferences, we also get a stable matching. Even though we're adding this new feature that could lead to new blocking pairs, with continuity, we still get a stable match. But it's generally the case that the set of stable matches are not going to be a single tone. So we can have multiple stable matchings here. Uh, and it's easy to see why. We can imagine a situation in which peer preferences are just super important. So let's say all I care about is peer preferences, let's say. Uh, if all the good students are going to a certain school, let's say they're going all to Harvard, then Harvard becomes the best school. But if for some reason all the best students are going to uh, Iowa University, then that becomes the best school and all the good students desire to be there. So we can have more than one stable matching with your preferences in this sense. So the proof of that existence that we have is constructive and is going to provide an algorithm, how to find it but it requires knowledge of the full functional form of peer preferences. And we don't know how to elicit this in practice. It's a bit of a complex problem. I would have to be able to ask individuals, how would they react or what would be their loss um, for any type of 
assignment and any type of support distribution. One alternative that one could imagine is uh, what would happen if we were to run deferred acceptance, which is the standard matching mechanism, with some transparency. So uh, instead of requiring stability just now in this specific time period, I imagine that maybe as students learn over time, new cohorts of students are able to learn a little bit about how the score distribution will, uh, will be at each program. And over time, we can expect a convergence to stability. Okay. So for example, in Australia, and this, there's something similar that happens in CISU, the Brazilian system. But in Brazilian system, you get to know for each day, what's the score distribution for this cohort. Uh, in Australia, we have something similar, but you get to know a, a sufficient statistic, a statistic of the ability distribution in the previous period. And you're able to know how many students have scores below that. They have also, a, just like DNA in Brazil, they have this ATAR score, which is a standardized score that is mostly based on this general test that they make. Not fully as, as it is in, in VNN in Brazil, but it's mostly based on this standardized test. Okay, so what would happen if we were to have uh, the same mechanism that is misspecified only asks about uh, preferences over programs happening over time? So suppose that we have a discrete time model, time zero, one, two, to infinity. And we have a replica economy. So in every period of time, the individuals with the same distribution of scores and references, uh, and the schools with the same distribution of references as well, and the same set of schools every time, they all appear time and time again. So at each time t, the, inco the incoming students are able to see, just as we saw here in the Australian example, they're able to see a sufficient statistic, but suppose that they can see the entire distribution of scores less period. So we have this matching mu zero, which is just some exogenous thing to initialize the mechanism. But over time, um, the incoming students observe the last period distribution of ability. And at each time, students submit their preferences and the matching is chosen through deferred acceptance. Okay. Now here's the assumption. The students submit their true preferences induced by the ability distribution. So they have no best guess as to what, what will be the ability distribution this period. They just think that the last time, the last period alternative uh, ability distribution is reflected, will be reflected now once more. Okay. So we're gonna call this project, this process, the, this dynamic process, the Catonement with Intermediate Matching Process, TIM. So this transparency, as I know the ability distribution in the previous period, induces a tournament process where, so if you remember from micro, uh, in a tournament process, prices adjust over time until we reach an equilibrium, general equilibrium type of models. Here, over time, I learn about the distribution of ability of others and I best respond to it. I submit my preferences given uh, the ability distribution of the last period, as I assume that it happens this period around. Okay, so as we had, as we generally have for many scenarios, a, a convergence of prices to a stable, to a equilibrium in general equilibrium models, here we could think of having a, a convergence of the ability distribution to a stable matching. Okay. Okay, so the second type of result we have is that uh, if the ability distribution is in a steady state, only if the distribution of the distribution, the matches are going to a stable matching. So the idea here is that if we see that the, uh, the distribution of scores are getting closed over time, I should think of the ability of the the sequence of matchings being close to stable, okay? And this holds both for this version of the model where I show the entire distribution of abilities from the previous cohort. And also if I just show, uh, and they only have preferences over an aggregate statistic, 
is this S of the distribution lambda. So does this process converge overall? So I'm gonna give you two examples here that show that this process might converge and might not converge. Uh, yeah, depends for example, depending for example, on what is this aggregate statistic that we give students. So suppose that you have only one prod, one program with a capacity, this positive capacity Q. And at every period of time, I just showed the mean score of students enrolled at that program. So students have this zero utility of mean and match. The outside option gives like a zero utility. And they have a utility of being matched given by uh, uniformly distributed, this intrinsic value of enrolling without accounting for peer preferences yet. And, but they have a cost of being assigned to a program and having a score there, which is going to be this R theta given that there's only one school, lower than the mean. So they like being assigned to the school, but they don't want to be below the mean. They face some particular cost K. Now, suppose that we start with some, and this is only on their mind, in their minds, just the S0, this mean that they imagine that this will have, which is lower than the capacity that's left, one minus Q. So here's like a graphical representation. On the X axis, we have student scores, and on the Y axis, we have the share of students enrolling in, um, in, in a matching. Okay, so first of all, as they imagine that S0 is low, the mean is low, all the students with the, the K students, the Q students with the highest scores here, they're all going to apply to the school. Okay, they think they're all above the average. As it happens in the next period, the new cohort of schools are going to see, no, the mean is actually S1, way above the S0 from before, the previous mean. And uh, as we are assuming here that there's some uniform distribution of scores, it's going to be bigger than half of the set of students that were assigned. So some of this lower half, this lower half of students that have scores below the mean, um, they all, some of them have your, they have the peer cost. So some of them will just drop out of the school and we're going to have this longer tail, this low, longer, um, lower tail. So students who have lower scores, but they don't care much about being below the mean are going to now apply, given that some who had a higher score but care a lot about being below the mean decided to drop out. But if this longer, if this tail is long enough, we can have that the mean now is going to be again lower than one minus Q, and we're back to the situation from before. Now that the mean is super low, all the students with score, the Q students with the highest scores now say, ah, I will have a score that's higher than the mean, therefore I'm going to apply again. So we go back to this uh, to all the Q highest score students enrolling. So I go from this to this all the time. So all the Q students, the mean increases, they all, uh, the lower half sees that they have lower scores and then they drop out. So we don't have convergence in this sense. We have this cycle from all the good students applying, then the long tail, some bad students applying but they don't care about being below the mean and so forth. So we can see from this example that we should not expect in general that, <coughs> A replica economy in which in each in each period, um, this the a replica of the set of individuals learn about the distribution of scores would converge to a stable matching over time. They don't even converge at all. Okay, but this is a bit particular to the example of the mean. If we change the score that we show students, for example, if it's the median of scores we're going to see that we will have convergence, okay? So let's go through the example a little bit. Um, again, we start with the mean in their heads, the S0 being below one minus Q. So all the Q students with the highest scores are all going to apply because they say I'm above the mean or I'm above the median. Now, in the next period, we do see that uh, the students with score below the median, some of them face pure costs, and we again have the long tail. But here's the thing. 
given that S, the aggregate statistic that we present and that students care about, uh, is now the median and not the mean, uh, the median is not so sensitive to the fact that we have this long lower tail. It doesn't go down at all because we have now some bad students, given that we had this mass of this mass of Q divided by two, half of the capacity of the school of students with high scores. So the median is uh, still left as it were. Okay, so in the next period, we still have the same median. And we have convergence. We just stick with this particular distribution. This set of students decide to apply and are able to get in. Okay, all the students with score uh, above P3, between P3 and the median, the ones that don't care much about being below the median, and all the set of Q divided by two best students. So as you can see here, even in transparency, we might have convergence and we might not, depending on what we show students and how their peer preferences are. Now, here are some sufficient conditions for convergence. We're going to see that in this Australia economy, the college admission system in Australia, we're going to have enough sufficient conditions to have us uh, to guarantee that we're going to converge to something like a stable matching. So a little bit on the background, and this is also a preview, uh, an idea of how we identify peer preferences and the functional form in this setting. So this is a bit more of the applied micro part of the, the paper. So in Australia, they have these centralized matching markets assigning students to university major programs. As I said, you apply to a particular major, not only to the program as a whole, to the university as a whole. So student preferences are mostly 90% determined by the standardized test, which leads them to have an ATAR score. Okay. And this is supposed to be a proxy, and there are studies on that, uh, of student ability. And there is an anecdotal evidence that students do see the ATAR score as a good indicator of ability of students. Okay. Now, students are told, as we mentioned before, something that's like the median ATAR score from entering class at each program in the previous period. Okay. We're going to observe the universe of applications and the ATAR summary statistics from the years 2003 to 2016 in this state in Australia called New South Wales, the NSW, the largest state in the country. So how are we going to identify that students have um, this big fish preferences? They don't like to be the small fish in a big pond. So we're going to exploit two forms of variation here. First, we're going to do an across-person analysis. So we're going to analyze the changes in the popularity in the programs as you see the, the summary statistic change from year to year. So uh, we're going to be calling this statistics from the previous periods, the POIS, previous year statistic. And we're going to compare uh, controlling for trends in program quality. So the students who have an ATAR that's higher than the statistic from the previous years are unaffected by changes in it over time, but those below are less likely to apply. Okay, so this means that if you have an ATAR that's higher than the POIS, the previous year statistic, you don't seem to care much, but if you have one below, you are less likely to apply to when this, the, the statistic increases, meaning that you probably don't like to be below the, the median, the lower, but the bottom half of the students. Okay, and, and, and this is going to be the focus here today. We're going to do a within person analysis because the across person analysis is going to capture uh, a lot of aggregate changes in preferences over time, but the within person analysis is going to, to work with an inversion of rankings that we observe before and after people learn their scores. So here, here's how it works. Now, suppose that Stanford has the highest score in summary statistics, then Brown. And suppose that Ricardo and Daniel have a recorded list before knowing their HR score. So they rank Brown, Stanford, Penn State, both of them rank the same thing. This is the pre-row because it's before knowing their own ATAR score because they are able to submit one before and after knowing it. Then I get a low score, Daniel gets a high score. And given that we now know our, our ATAR scores, we change our lists. So for example, now that I know that I have a low score, I'm now going to put Stanford below Penn State because I don't want to be in the lower uh, 
yeah, among the lowest ability students at Stanford. And now that Daniel saw that he has a high score, <laughs> uh, he knows that he's not going to be below, so he puts Stanford above Brown in his rank order list. So this is the type of change that we're going to be looking at. How do you change your, um, your rank order list as you learn about your score? Okay, so we're going to compare the pre and the post rank order lists and see if, uh, if there's something systematic about it. Okay, so here's one type of thing that we see. So <clears throat> the students with the lowest score, the gap between the previous year statistic and the ATAR seems to be much lower after they align their score. So we can see that the red line, which is the one after the score, um, is basically always below the one above when we go to the lowest ATAR scores. So students are, uh, as I did here in this example, Ricardo did here, uh, as they learn that their gap is, that their score is low, they put the student, the school with the highest score summary statistic below in their, their rankings. So you can see here that it was the second choice of Ricardo, so now it's the third one. Also, uh, we have switches, just like there was here. Stanford went from the second place to the third. And we also have removal, uh, removals and additions. Okay? So we're going to see how the, the gap between the previous year statistic and the eight-year score is related to what, whether you promote, add, or remove a course. And we generally see that the gap is correlated to removing a course negatively correlated to adding a course, and negatively correlated to promoting a course. If we look at only um, the top or top two schools and the control for row length, so no specifications, we get this uh, result significant. Okay, so given that, we have identified that students have, we have evidence that Students have these big fish preferences. They don't like to be in a school where their score is lower than the, the median or in general case high score. <clears throat> so we're able to put a little more structure on our TIM model. And so first of all, we can now assume that students have this, schools have this common rankings. So if the ATAR, the standardized score is what determines, um, or acceptance at each, each program for exactly this NSW market, the New South Wales market, we can assume that students have common rankings, common rankings across programs and that they have these big fish preferences. They have a particular utility, V, theta C, uh, a payoff B for student theta being assigned to program C, but they also face some costs that are going to need to be very general, <laughs> just that it's higher, the bigger the gap between your score and the median score. Of the, the school. And if you are above the median score or above the area statistic, you don't face this peer cost. So you don't, so, uh, you don't like being below, but you don't care much about being above the median score or in general, the SC, the area the statistic, k highest score. Okay, so we're going to have that in any New South Wales market, so we not only have assumptions that individuals care about the distribution of ability of others, we now have common rankings and big fish preferences. Um, we're going to see that there is a unique stable matching. If you remember in the general model, we don't have uniqueness here, but here we do. And in the dynamic process, the replicate economy will converge in finite time. Okay, so a little bit about what we observe. So we do see <laughs> that the gap between the scores for a year, so the current year statistic and the previous year statistic is indeed going to zero. It's decreasing over time, which would mean that the scores, the area score, the median scores are uh, converging to a particular value. And this is not due to composition change, not because schools are, uh, programs or schools are leaving or entering the markets. This goes through if we break down to schools 
each year, which, which are in, uh, in the data for any particular number of years. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here's the problem though. We assume that we had uh, uh, a replica economy, the same set of schools over time and uh, the set of students that come over time are distributed the same. They have the same preferences and um, the same distribution of scores. But in reality, we have some programs that are less desired that are more short-lived, okay? So many programs here only exist not in the 14 years of the data, but two, three, four years of the data. And these are generally <coughs> uh, less desired programs. So in general, if this process converges very fast, much faster than the rate of entry and exit, we're going to have a stable matching happening anyway. But if not, so we cannot guarantee again that it's going to converge in this finite time, this hard bound that we had last time. Um, <clears throat> so if this entry and exit is happening uh, very frequent, we are unlikely to achieve stability. Okay. So we're going to model formally entry and exit in settings just like the cold Christian during your day. And the convergence results are going to follow to uh, are going to be extended to show that popular long lived programs, even though there is entry and exit of lower, less desirable uh, programs, we're going to have convergence of the more convergent, uh, the more desirable programs. Okay. So these bigger changes of entry and exit are going to lead to uh, more instability in the market for the lower ranked students, the students with the lower ability in our setting, and which will lead to higher attrition. So some students are going to get into schools that they don't really would like to be. And this is a bigger problem for low socioeconomic status students because they're generally in the lower half of the distribution. Okay, so the problems we have with the TIM process, as we said, is that it might take time to converge. And if the market fundamentals change from year to year, this might cause instability, okay? And it might not even necessarily converge. So instead of that, we propose a mechanism to improve upon these issues, asking about, which mimics a bit what's done in CISU. So we ask individuals, we subdivide the set of students and ask them to give a rank ordered list. <laughs> Through that, we have a real statistics to show this other subset of students and we iterate it like that. Okay, so we, if we have convergence of the economy in the replica economy, we should have convergence at each period of time if we do mimic the convergence process at the period itself. Okay? So this is a kind of iterative delay mechanism uh, similar to the one used in many countries. As I said, this is in Brazil, but also in China, Germany, Tunisia, and Croatia. Okay, so Wrapping up, we present a tractable matching model with a continuum of students and a finite set of schools. We prove that we can generally expect existence of stable matchings even with uh, peer preferences, but it's unlikely to find it using standard mechanism. Again, you would need to ask for a functional form of peer abilities in a general, uh, yeah, in a general setting. But over time, if you have a replica economy, the pseudo tautonomous process emerges where the, the statistics or the ability distribution uh, serves the role of prices, which might lead to stability or not, as the mean and the median example shows. And we identify the functional form of peer preferences, which is this uh, aversion to being the small fish in a big pond, to being below the, in the bottom half of the distribution. And we present a new mechanism, the TFM, the atonement with final matching that mimics what happens in the entire process in the replica economy, the TIM process, but period by period. So it's more stable uh, as there might be changes over time in the market. Okay. So yeah, thank you. Questions and comments are welcome. This is my email. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so 
Does anyone have any questions? Okay, um, if not, okay. so thank you, Matthias and Danielle, for your presentation, really great. And thank you all for coming and watching. Thank you, Ricardo and Danielle, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>